Okay, uh, again, this is our schedule for right now. We're going to talk about silence and solitude. We'll get into some of the other things later on. I want to start out today by asking a question. And that question is, why are we so afraid? And to sort of start us on what I mean by that is a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We are so afraid of silence that we chase ourselves from one event to the next in order not to have to spend a should be spend, sorry, spend a moment alone with ourselves in order not to have to look at ourselves in the mirror. It is a simple fact that in our culture, being the North American culture, we are so addicted to having sound all the time, be it television or radio or iPod or something, that the very idea of silence scares us. Um, did any of the rest of you come from a family where no matter what was going on, the television had to be on? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I literally had been gone for two years, went back to Kentucky, walked in, my sister and my mother were there, she, my mother was visiting with my sister, walk in, they go, hello, good to see you, and then they're watching television. <laughs> I haven't seen them in almost two years. And I'm just going crazy. But the fact is that Oop, back up. We are deathly afraid of quiet. We are deathly afraid of being alone, most of us. Even if we won't necessarily admit it, Norm? With the demographics <coughs> we have here, though, how valid do you think that is? I think it's very valid. Even, even I mean, though you, I can see with us in our 60s, some of you not, but with, in our 60s, 70s, 80s, you think it's still valid? I think it's still true that a lot of people feel like they have to have some noise going on in the background. And particularly, even if that's not the issue, the issue of being alone. I think the older many of us get, the more afraid we are of being alone. One of the greatest fears people have is dying alone. Sure. Which is all related to that. Okay. So, I want to talk a little bit about why we are afraid, as a culture, of being alone and quiet. Why do we feel we have to have the constant presence of music and television, of crowds and noise? And it may be that we don't feel like we need to have the TV on or the radio on if we're getting older, but how many people, if they haven't been out at a restaurant with people that they know in a few days, they start getting nervous about it? We still need crowds. We still need, you know, we still need activity. Um, Western culture, on the whole, has taught us that we can be comfortable with noise and crowds. We cannot be comfortable with silence and solitude, with being alone with being quiet. We are simply addicted to noise. I know people who that very much, one of our, Carolyn and I, one of our dearest friends, will openly admit that if she is in the car, if the radio is not on, she's not comfortable. She has to have the music on. She will be at home, I've mentioned this before, she'll be at home, she will have the television on, and the radio on, and be working on her computer. And if she doesn't have all that going on, she gets very uncomfortable, and she knows she's uncomfortable. She recognizes that she has an addiction to having this. She's, you know, she's our age, she's single, and I think that much of it, the issue, the reason I'm talking about silence and solitude together is because those two things really are connected. Foster in his book talks about that. He says he couldn't figure out on that chapter for a long time, he debated whether to call the chapter about silence as a discipline or solitude as a discipline. Well, I agree with Whitney's approach. He's got one chapter called Silence and Solitude. Because those two things really are connected. The fact is that it's only in solitude, and particularly in silence, that we can break our addiction to noise, to music, to advertising, to voices and words, um, to, to get away from that feeling of need. And particularly, I believe the reason that those things, those things bother us is because we don't really trust that God is there for us. And so we don't really believe that He will never leave us or forsake us. That in Hebrews, that's a quote from Deuteronomy. Jesus, of course, in the Great Commission said, And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So the idea that we're afraid to be alone, we're afraid to be quiet, I believe goes back to the fact that we don't really trust that God is there for us. We don't really trust that He's going to be sufficient to meet our needs. Um, and, and so we're simply uncomfortable about that. We're uncomfortable with solitude. We're uncomfortable with quiet and silence. And yet the only thing that will free us from this fear, the only thing that will bring us to a point of trust, and that really is the issue here, do we trust that God is there for us? Um, 
The only thing to get us there is if we actually begin to practice <clears throat> silence and solitude. If we find times and places to get by ourselves, to be quiet, to um, begin to experience the sort of inner fulfillment God can give us, that's the only way we get rid of the loneliness and fear that we feel most of the time for, during uh, not having noise around. We then, as we experience silence and solitude, and begin to feel God's presence in that, and He begins to assure us that we can trust Him to be there with us. We can trust Him to, to be there to meet our needs, and we don't have to have all this outside distraction. Then we can begin to feel we're not alone. We begin to know that to be the truth. Only silence and solitude will bring us to the point where we aren't addicted to that noise and to that, the crowds will bring us to the place where we're comfortable with it. Right now, most of us in our culture, we believe that being quiet and waiting is somehow unproductive. You've got to do something. Um, we're, we are so inundated with noise and with activity in our culture that when it's not there, we feel like something is wrong, that something ought to be happening that's not happening. And the, the thing we need in order to get over that is more time alone, to be alone with God, to have fewer words around us, um, one of the, the uh, devotional guides for spiritual disciplines talks about the fact that our lives are like um, a jar that is filled with, with water that has uh, mud in it. And it's constantly being stirred up. And so our life is, lives are constantly this sort of stirred up, muddy mixture of stuff. And the only way we can resolve that is by being still and letting all of the stuff settle to the bottom so that we can see clearly through what's important in it. That's the, and that stillness, that quiet, is the only thing that will get us there. It's only in solitude that we can begin to get an accurate sense of ourselves. See, so many people, and I think this is true with our friend, her sense of who she is, she's only comfortable with her sense of who she is, when she's got noise around that keeps her from having to think about it, or when she's got people around that give her some sense of who she is as a person. When in fact, we're supposed to find our personhood in God. We're supposed to find our security in His presence in our lives. That doesn't mean other people aren't wonderful and valuable. But if we need them, and if we need the noise in order to be okay and not be afraid, then we have a problem. We have an addiction. Um, it reminds me of a, a woman that used to work for me, and she had a younger brother-in-law. Her brother-in-law was like 20. And she said her brother-in-law said to her one time that he did not like to go to a movie theater unless, uh, movie unless there were other people in the theater. Because... <laughs> Unless there were other people there, he wasn't sure when he should laugh. <laughs> and she told me that story as an example of just how dumb her brother-in-law was. But the point is, that's exactly how many of us are. We don't know how to respond to the things of life unless there's somebody else there with us that we can watch and see when did they laugh. Am I supposed to laugh now? We determine how we're supposed to respond to life based upon having other people around us all the time. Well, God wants to be the one that guides us in that. God wants to be the one that tells us when to laugh and when to mourn. Not other people. And unless we find some time away from those other people and get comfortable enough to not feel like somebody else has to be around talking to us or be, you know, being present with us in order for us to know when to laugh, then we're always going to be insecure. We're always going to have some fear. That's what the disciplines of silence and solitude are all about in the Christian faith. Pat? I guess I don't really understand silence. Are you talking about just sitting in a chair and just Being sitting silent. in a chair? Well, a lot of it has to do with just not talking and not letting somebody else talk to you. We're going to talk about what to do specifically. Okay. But yes, we're talking about silence. Not having the TV on, not having the radio on, not having somebody talking to you. Um, but could you be reading your Bible? or? Yes, you can. In fact, that's the first, the first aspect of silence you ought to have is the time you have every day when you read the Word and when you pray. That should be your first experience of silence and of solitude. Don't do that with the TV on in the background or the radio on in the background. Um, have a quiet time. And ideally have a quiet place where you're dealing with that. That's the first aspect of solitude and silence, is to read God's Word and to pray. But there are other ways in which we need to do it as well, which become extensions of our prayer life. And we'll talk about that. Okay? Question. Yes. I can be very aware of God's presence in my life when there's a lot of noise around, but I can't hear what He has to tell me. Exactly. And we're going to talk about that. It's, there's several reasons for the silence and solitude. Some of them is to encourage the other disciplines, all right? like the disciplines of reading God's Word or praying. 
But the biggest reason, the most important reason, is to hear God's voice. God could be trying to talk to you, and if you've got the TV and the radio and the laptop on, and you're focusing on that stuff, you're not going to hear his voice. Because there's too much else. You know, have you ever, have you, living in Mexico, have you not been someplace where there's so much noise going on, fireworks and dogs barking, and, you know, the evento next door and all of that, and forget trying to have a conversation with anybody because you can't, you know, you can't even pick it up through all of the clamor and clatter. God feels the same way sometimes. I think sometimes he says, I would love to be able to speak to Ross, but he's got so much noise going on around him, I'm not going to get through, so I'll be quiet. Okay. How can a person decipher when he's hearing God and not simply his own thoughts? Okay, well, let's, we'll get to that. <coughs> Let me give you a couple of other sort of foundational stuff, and then we'll get around to the process we go through. First, let's get some definitions. The discipline of silence means to voluntarily and temporarily, we're not recommending that you enter a monastery and never speak for the rest of your life, hmm. uh, to voluntarily and temporarily refrain from speaking, and perhaps from external noise and distractions as well, so that we might hear God more clearly and grow closer to Him. That idea of hearing God. And always, the purpose of this is growing closer to God, to grow in holiness. So that's the discipline of silence. To be intentional and voluntary and temporary in being quiet, not talking yourself, not having other noise around you. Then the discipline of solitude means to voluntarily and temporarily withdraw to privacy that we might grow closer to God. And this is very simple. You know, we talk about having a relationship with God. We were made for a relationship with God. What kind of relationship would you have with your spouse or beloved one or when you were dating or whatever? I mean, when you, especially when you were dating and feeling romantic, feeling a real love for this person, didn't you want to spend time alone? Was there not a drive, a desire to spend time just with that other person and not have everybody else interfering with that? Well, that same motivation we should feel for the God who loves us that much. The idea that if we love God, if we desire to be in a relationship with Him, there should be times we want to be alone with Him and not have everybody else there and not have all sorts of other uh, uh, noises. <laughs> Dr. Whitney, who's one of the, uh, the authors of the two books we have, says there are times to eliminate the voices of the world in order to hear undistracted the voice of God. This is what Richard's just saying. God may be trying to talk to me, but if I've got so much noise going on I can't hear Him, that doesn't help. So I need to have times in my life when I am quiet and still and listening to the things of God. So first, we seek the, the disciplines of silence and solitude in order to make room for the other disciplines. You cannot have an effective prayer life or an effective Bible study if you've got all this other stuff going on around you. You can't. And I'm one who was in, in high school, I used to say, oh yeah, I can watch TV and do my homework at the same time. My homework would have been much better if I had done that, okay? And you all say to your kids, no, you can't. You can't do your homework well while watching the TV. Well, you can't be listening, you know, you can't be praying, you can't be studying the Word effectively if you're watching TV or having the radio on in the background or anything either. You need to have quiet for that. So the first thing is that the solitude and silence allow us to make room for the other disciplines that bring us closer to God. And then the second reason, which is reflected here in Whitney's uh, quote, so that we might hear God's voice more clearly. We go to the quiet, and I think part of it is the very discipline we have of seeking the quiet in order to hear God is honoring to Him in a way that He will speak more directly to us on things. God is always anxious to speak to us, to let us hear His voice, but we have to prove that we're serious about listening, and this is one of the best ways to do it, is to pursue silence and solitude. If we, uh, now it's important to note here that we're not talking about just being quiet. I mean, that is maybe what you, it's not just like sitting in a chair and not talking to anybody or not letting anybody talk to you. Within this, this is not a spiritual discipline unless we do it with a heart to listen to God and His voice. So it's not, it's not just a, you know, like an Eastern meditation, sit in silence, empty your mind, think about a black spot on a white paper kind of thing. No. The purpose is silence and solitude for the sake of Asking God to speak to us so that we might hear His voice more clearly. Yes? It seems to me like it's having a date with God. To an extent it is like having a date with God. And you have a conversation and you want to listen to Him and He wants to listen to you too. Right. You know, uh, 
uh, scripture, we're called God's beloved. And if we are his beloved, then we should want to spend time. Just, just he and us. Okay? All right, now, at a big point here, too, uh, well, well, let me give you a, a couple more things. Dallas Willard, who I quoted a lot last week in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, is a wonderful book. Um, he says, we must reemphasize the desert or closet, which are symbols or, or uh, metaphors for places of, of solitude and silence is the primary place of strength for the beginner. He's talking about the spiritual, the beginner in the spiritual disciplines. As it was for Christ and for Paul. We're going to look at some of the examples of Christ later where he, he practiced this discipline. And remember, we desire to be more like Jesus. And Jesus sought solitude and sought, sought silence. So we'll look at that. They show us their example, what we must do. In stark aloneness, it is possible to have silence, to be still, to know that Job, Jehovah, is indeed God. And this is from Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And I think that expression, be still, takes in both the issue of being silent and being alone. Not disrupted and, you know, in the midst of chaos or other people or talking or noise or anything else. Be still and know that I am God. Now, there's an old proverb, which is quoted in one of our books, that all those who open their mouths close their eyes. <laughs> we need to recognize that silence and solitude have the advantage of allowing us to see and hear much more clearly the things of God. By closing our mouths, by closing <coughs> off the noise that we tend to have clattering around us all the time, we can see and hear the things of God more clearly, especially His voice, but also His intention and His direction. And the real issue here, when we talk about silence, is not that you shouldn't speak. It's possible to not say anything and still be in absolute chaos inside, right? Or to not understand what's the point of the silence and to not find it beneficial or blessing or anything else. The real issue in the not speaking part of the silence, that is to not talk, is to gain control of our impulse to speak. Do you know people who cannot not talk? <coughs> I do, and have known people like that. There was a woman that I knew who was dating a friend of mine, and she was always, she would call me because she always want to talk to me about Larry. And <laughs> I'll tell you what her name was. And she would talk, 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 talk. And I swear to you, it's true. One night, I was so tired of this, I took the phone and I laid it down. And I went in the bedroom, and I did stuff for like three or four or five minutes, and I came back, I just walked out of the camera, picked up the phone, she had, did not even know I was gone. Um, people who have a compulsion to talk, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denigrating them, you know, in some way I feel great sympathy for that. I think I used the example before, Michael Crichton in his book Travels talks about going to Africa into a blind at night where you're supposed to be able to see the animals coming and the family comes in and they start talking and, and the guy says, no, you have to be quiet, you have to be silent. And they're quiet for just a minute or two and then they start talking. And he says, no, no, you have to be completely quiet. <clears throat> Three or four minutes later, they start talking. And Michael Crichton said, that was the first experience he'd ever had, but he experienced it later, where there's some people who have a compulsion to have to talk. If there is a moment of silence, they feel the need to fill it because they're uncomfortable with silence. And there's several reasons for that. For one thing, I think it has to do with, with a lack of control of the situation. You know, that, that it, it's sort of like bringing up our dogs again, if, you, if you've ever owned dogs. Dogs have a very clear need for understanding who's in charge, who's in control. You know, it's the alpha dog they talk about. And if you ever, have ever owned a dog and it wasn't clear that you were the boss, that you were in charge, then the dog starts thinking whether they feel like they're really up to it or not, whether they're really alpha material or not, they have to start being in control. They have to start acting like they're in charge because somebody has to be and you're not doing it. And they start acting out. They start doing things that you're going, what is wrong with you, crazy dog? Well, it's because they need somebody to be clearly in control, in charge. There's a great book called, um, the, well, it's by the monks of New Skeet. And what's it called? 
forgotten. I've forgotten. Anyway, the monks of New Ski or the Skunks of New Meat. Uh, monks of New Ski. And they, this monastery, that's what they do, is they train dogs. They raise dogs, train dogs, and they help people with problem dogs. And they say that one of the things that they've discovered, the most common thing that they've discovered amongst dogs that have behavioral problems is the dogs aren't clear that you're the boss, that you're the alpha, that you're in charge, and so they act out. That same motivation of needing to have control, of knowing somebody is in charge of the situation, I believe is why so many people are not comfortable letting silence happen. They have to talk, they have to interject themselves into it, because that's a way of saying that, okay, I'm going to try to get control here, because silence means nobody's in charge. And what does that say about our belief about God being in charge? The point is that when we're silent, when we don't need to speak all the time, that's one way of us saying, God, we're, we have faith that you're in charge. And so I don't need to be. I can be quiet in your presence because you have control of the situation, even if people get uncomfortable with it. Now, it doesn't mean never saying anything, which is a, which is a danger. It, it means understanding the appropriate times to speak, and not speaking just for the sake of, of speaking. Thomas Akimba said, is it, it is easier to be silent altogether than to speak with moderation. One of the signs of spiritual maturity is to understand when to speak and when not to speak. <clears throat> and in the same way that we talked about when, we, when you fast, one of the things that fasting does is it, it teaches you just how much of the food you thought you needed really wasn't necessary. <laughs> Okay? You really don't need to eat as much as you do. In the same way, silence teaches us that so many of the words we thought were important, we thought were necessary, really aren't. And so we can be more discerning in when we speak and when we don't. Ecclesiastes 3.7 says, There is a time to keep silent and a time to speak. And so a person who is mature in this discipline, the discipline of silence and solitude, knows what needs to be said and when they need to say it. You've known people like that, I hope. People who didn't talk a lot, but when they did speak, everybody listened because it was usually good. Because they knew when to speak and what to say. That is the sign of somebody who has grown mature in this and understands the right time to speak. It's not complete silence, and it certainly is not from talking all the time. Again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Real silence, real stillness, means holding one's tongue, and that becomes a sober consequence of spiritual stillness. Knowing when to hold your tongue, <clears throat> not just being silent all the time. Only when we learn to be silent when, will we be able to speak the word that is needed when it is needed. That's one of the consequences of this discipline. Okay? Any questions about that? We do have an example, by the way, of this, uh, in fact, Ecclesiastes, another thing in Ecclesiastes 5, it talks about um, to draw near and listen to God is better than the sacrifice of fools. Drawing near and listening to God is better than the sacrifice of fools. What is the sacrifice of fools? It means just shooting off your mouth when you don't really have anything to say in order to try to be pious, righteous, whatever. And we have a brilliant example of that in the Gospel of Matthew. The Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him. He goes up, and there's this miraculous appearance of Moses and Elijah who talk to Jesus, apparently in preparation, as they're having a discussion, probably because this is immediately prior to the Passion, Jesus' sacrifice. And Peter, James, and John are witnessing this. They see Moses and Elijah and Jesus, you know, this glowing light and transfigured. And it says, Matthew 17, 4, and answering, Peter said, we should build three tabernacles, one for each of you. Well, Peter answered, nobody had said anything to him. He was answering the stillness. He was answering the quiet. He felt a need to say something to try to get control in a situation that he had no control over and shouldn't have felt the need to control. And in fact, it's very funny that in the Gospels, after Peter says this rather silly thing, you know, building a tabernacle with Moses and Elijah and Jesus out of the Transfiguration, you know, like they need some place to stay while they're there, the Gospels have a parenthetical statement and says, Peter did not know what to say. That's the sacrifice of fools. When you don't know what to say, 
when there's not anything that needs to be said, when you should not be speaking, and you do it anyway. The sacrifice of fools. Being silent sometimes teach us, teaches us not to need to talk, to fill that emptiness, to fill that void, not to feel a need to take control of a situation like that, like Peter did. Now, frequently we want to take control of a situation because we want to make sure people don't misunderstand us. We keep talking, and I've done this, I mean, I'm somebody who talks for a living, right? But I've said something and thought, oh, they may have misunderstood that, let me explain it. Well, that wasn't very good, let me try again. No, one more time, no. Well, we do that in social situations where we're afraid somebody might be thinking less of us or have misunderstood us, and so we try to take control of the situation by talking and talking and talking to try to explain ourselves and make us look a little better and make people understand us a little better, which all is another way of saying we don't believe God's in control. We have to keep talking in order to make sure everybody understands because God's not in control of this situation. People might misunderstand when Jesus was accused of so many things and being tried, what was his response? Silence. Silence. He did not respond to the accusations because he knew God the Father was in charge. One of the few things he said during the whole trials of his passion was, you can do nothing to me except the Father in heaven gives you the ability to. What's that? Other than saying, God is in control of this situation. I don't need to keep talking. I don't need to explain it. I don't need to... Take, take control of the situation to make sure everybody gets enough words to figure out what's really going on here because God is in control. So one of the things that causes us to talk so much is a feeling of the need for self-justification. And what is self-justification, Carolyn? It's a powerful motivator. A powerful motivator. <laughs> you get the feeling she's heard this before? I didn't set her up today. Um, I had a client once, or I actually had a person who worked for me once who had a client. The client did something really crazy because they were trying to cover their own backside. And I went into uh, this woman who worked for me into her office, and I went on the board, and I, I wrote um, a couple things up. One of them was, self-justification is a powerful motivator. They, they had messed up, the client had messed up, but they need to try to blame us in order to feel better about themselves. That idea that we need to justify ourselves is why so many people talk so often, is I need to keep talking in order for people to know I'm okay, to justify ourselves. We don't have to do that if we believe God is in control. He'll take care of that. Questions about any of that? So you're saying there are worse things than being misunderstood? There are worse things than being misunderstood. Good thing, good, good uh, way to sum that up. And in fact, if we believe God is in control, then we will not be misunderstood beyond the point that you know God desires for it to occur. Let's look at some of the reasons for silence and solitude. The first reason, which I mentioned already, is to follow the example of Jesus. Our desire in becoming more holy, to pursue holiness, is to become more like Jesus. I'm going to give you four examples where Jesus exercised these disciplines. In Matthew 4.1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. For 40 days, Jesus not only fasted, but he was by himself and went through long periods of quiet. This is when the devil tempts him three times. Jesus responds with God's word. So, and this is the start of his ministry. In fact, the times when Jesus does um, spend time alone and in prayer and in silence are, the, are some of the most critical times in his ministry. This is at the start, before he starts his earthly ministry. He goes off for 40 days in the desert by himself. Then we have Matthew 14, 23, and... Uh, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. We have a number of cases where it says that Jesus went off to a solitary place. He went off by himself. He spent the night in a quiet place. Silence, solitude. Mark 1, 35. This is, has to do with the um, electing of the <coughs> apostles. Okay. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And in fact, it's, we're told Jesus spent the whole night praying in preparation for selecting the apostles. By himself, solitary place, praying. And Luke 40, 4.42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Now, one of the other things that we need to recognize in this is that Jesus... 
the instances where he went off to a quiet place to be alone, to pray, solitude, silence, prayer, frequently fasting, Remember, silence and solitude give us a foundation for a richer experience of the other disciplines. <clears throat> when he did that, he frequently did that right at the time when there were people clamoring for his help. This instance in, in uh, Luke 42 and in Mark as well, people had come to him for healing and they were clamoring, literally, you know. Uh, there are places where it says that they were, they were too busy ministering, he and the, the apostles were too busy ministering to eat. It says in Mark, you know, that they, they, people were crowding around the house so much nobody could get in or out. It was at times like that when there were people who needed help, whom Jesus very clearly could help, he still practiced the discipline of going off by himself for solitude and silence and prayer and fasting. Just being busy is no excuse, is my point. Even if the busyness that you have is for the sake of ministry. That's where burnout comes from. Jesus was wise that even when he was most in demand to do the things he came to do, to preach, to heal, to drive out demons, still he would go off four times, a night, a time, you know, early in the morning, for silence, for solitude, for prayer, frequently for over a period of time for fasting. So we need to recognize that to be more like Jesus, we need to practice the same spiritual disciplines that Jesus practiced, and this is one of them, or two of them, silence and solitude. I really think of them as one. Questions about that? Okay, let's look at some other reasons I believe that we are called to practice this. In order for us to hear God's voice more clearly, we've already referred to this, that we, we get to silence and solitude in order to not have the clamor of all the other noise around us. Uh, the passage from 1 Kings 19, a beautiful passage about Elijah. The Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. King James says a still, small voice. We want God to be there in earthquakes and mighty winds and fires and, you know, nuke them till they glow kind of experiences. Often God comes in the still, small voice, the gentle whisper. And are we prepared to hear that? I don't think we often are if we're surrounding ourselves with so much noise or if we spend all of our own time talking so that we can't hear someone else. Silence and solitude give us both the time and the space to think about our lives and to listen to what God has to say about them in our lives. Rich. I think we can apply that to prayer too because if we're praying and talking to God all the time, we can't hear what He's saying. So we need to be quiet and not say anything and just listen to him, right. uh, to what he has to say. Right. That the idea that prayer is just us telling God what we want, instead of prayer being a relationship, a relationship that involves a two-way conversation, where yes, God has told us, bring your needs to the throne of grace. Now tell, tell him you know, what you need, as well as praise him, thank him, you know, give him the adoration that he deserves, but then sometimes be quiet and listen to the things of God. That's, that's half the equation. I think when we talked about prayer, I gave the example, I said, if Carolyn and I are in a relationship, if I expected that our relationship was built upon me talking all the time and never listening to her, how well is that going to work? Nada. You know that. Same thing is true with God. And so... The silence and solitude give us the space in which we can more accurately and appropriately hear the voice of God. Okay? The next reason is to express our worship of God more directly and more purely. Habakkuk 2.20 says, The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before Him. Let all the earth be silent before Him. I think what this, this and other passages tell us is that true worship, that is personal worship, my own worship of God, my relationship with God, true personal worship does not necessarily require words or sounds or actions. 
the most intimate, most important kind of relationship I can have in worshiping God is where it is just him and me in silence, off, away from everybody else, where I can commune with him in prayer, by listening, to let the earth be silent before him as he is in his holy temple. And uh, again, as I said before, when you talk about worshiping God, silence and solitude maximize the practice of all the other spiritual disciplines. Um, okay? Then, to express our faith in God, which is related, uh, these are all related, they overlap. Psalm 62, 1-2 King David writes, My soul waits in silence for God only. For him, uh, for he, he is, not him is, for he is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. My soul waits in silence for God only. And it's fascinating. This is verse 1 and 2. If you go down to verse, I think it's 5 and 6, right below this in Psalm 62. If you're not careful, you'll read it and think it says the same thing again, but it doesn't. In verse 5 and 6, it says, My soul, comma, wait in silence for God only. Mm -hmm. David, as an act of will, is instructing his soul to be quiet. He's telling himself, wait on the Lord in silence. Which I think is a fascinating parallel to this. It's exactly the same words, except for... It's my soul, comma, wait in silence for God only. So first he establishes it as this is what I'm doing, and then he has to tell himself, do this now. To be silent, to come before the Lord, to recognize that true faith does not require words. It only requires that we lean on, or as some of the spiritual writers say, lean against the bosom of the Lord in silence. To experience his presence. Okay? Questions or comments about that? Go back and read Psalm 62. It's fascinating to see that parallel between the first verse and the, I think it's the third <coughs> verse. Other reasons for us to experience and practice the disciplines of silence and solitude to seek the Lord's salvation. Now, this can mean literally to be saved, that is, eternal salvation. Because silence and solitude, for those who are seekers, silence and solitude can help us become more aware, appropriately aware, and come to grips with our own sin, with our own impending death, with our the potential of our judgment. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking the way we can lead people to an awareness of their need for Jesus is by continuing to sing the same song over and over and over again. Sometimes we need silence. And true seekers, I think, often find the Lord in that silence. From Latin, and, but the other meaning of it is to seek God's salvation or His help, His preservation in times of great need, to go to Him in silence and solitude. And similarly, in prayer, obviously, and in fasting. We talked about this as the, the time when we need God's help with something, as a time of Scripture gives us examples of uh, fasting as well. Lamentations 3, 25 and 26 says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks him, it is good to wait out quietly for the salvation of the Lord. To sit in silence, in solitude, and wait upon the Lord. Our culture tells us that's a waste of time, to sit around and not do anything. But the scripture doesn't agree. A reason for silence and solitude is so that we can be physically and spiritually restored. I'm really looking forward to vacation, <laughs> to have some time. Now, I'm trying to find time and quiet now, and I do. But I get tired toward the end of these, you know, eight weeks of lecturing, six hours a week plus church and Bible study. Okay? I need that restoration, and you do too, whatever your particular burdens or schedule is. Mark 6, Jesus speaking to the disciples in verse 30 and 31 says... The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. They had been out ministering by his instruction. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, I mentioned this a minute ago, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, in this, in this case, it sounds more like a small group retreat. But still, come away from all the activity, even though there are all these people here who need to be ministered to, 
who need to be healed, demons need to be driven out, the, the Word of God needs to be preached, still, you need to come away by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. Same is true for us. For all the busyness that we do, all the people who work very hard in this church and whatever else you do, you need some time to get away. Jesus said no less to his own followers when, when there were people that still in need. All right? Then, to regain a spiritual perspective, John Owen, one of the great Puritan writers, said, What we are in our solitude, that we are indeed, and no more. When you cut out all the distractions, when you are alone and you are silent, then you begin to get a spiritual perspective on things. Um, Luke one twenty is the story of when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zachariah, the husband of Elizabeth, who would be the father of John the Baptist, who thought he was too old to have a son or child. Well, the angel Gabriel appears to him while he's in the temple doing his priestly duty and tells him that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son, and Zachariah says, Really? You serious? Do you know how old we are? And the angel Gabriel says, I am the angel Gabriel who stands in the very presence of the Lord, and it's his word I'm speaking to you now, and then it goes on to this, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Well, why did Gabriel make Zachariah be quiet, be silent? He literally could not speak for the ten months or so, you know, the time until Elizabeth conceived and then until John the Baptist was able to, was born, and then the day he was born, or the day, rather, he was supposed to be uh, um, given his name, then Zechariah got his voice back. I believe it was because this is a very vivid example where there's an enforced sense in which you, spiritually, don't have the right perspective, and so I'm going to help you get it. In this case, by enforcing silence. Zechariah couldn't speak. I think we can achieve... A, a regaining of appropriate spiritual perspective ourselves by voluntarily deciding there are times in which we're not going to speak. Getting away for time. And I'm going to talk about how to do that a little bit later, some more specifics. Got a couple more points I want to make here, and then we will take a break for a few minutes. Um, another reason, a very important reason, to exercise silence and solitude is to seek God's will on matters. Even Jesus did this. Are we not that much more in need of doing this? Jesus spent the night in, in solitude and in silence and in prayer before he chose the twelve apostles, for instance. Sometimes when we have a, a when we desire God's will, when we have a major decision to make or a major issue to deal with, and we want God to speak to us, sometimes God only reveals his will to us when we are apart and quiet. Now, God's voice can be loud enough to break through the cloud. But if we really are seeking his will for us, then part of our seeking of God is to get apart and ask him to speak to us in the quiet where we can listen to him and hear him clearly. Luke 6, one of those days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. Again, if before a major decision or event or responsibility, if Jesus saw the need to go out alone in silence and prayer to God before a decision is made, who are we to say that's not a really good idea? To learn to control our tongues. Okay, now you've done it. Um, two verses. I'll read the verses first. Uh, one from James and one from Proverbs. I've combined two verses here because James goes on at some length about the danger of the tongue. In the first chapter, verse 19, third chapter, verse 2, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And then in, in chapter 3, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Like, right. Anybody who never says anything wrong and is imperfect, raise your hand. Good. <laughs> uh, people who thought we were going to have to have some, some sort of exorcism there. Um, and then from Psalm, from Proverbs 17, the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. Remember that thing about control? That we know when to speak and when not? 
The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and discerning if they hold their tongues. Sort of a version of that that I had heard growing up was, you know, better, better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than open your mouth and prove it beyond any question or doubt, all right? Uh, well, Proverbs basically says that. Just, as I said earlier, just as fasting teaches us how much food we really need, as opposed to how much we thought we needed, then not speaking teaches us how many words we use that we did, really didn't need to. It teaches us control. Silence and solitude teaches us how many of the things that we say that we don't really need to say. And we begin to achieve what Proverbs and James is talking about, controlling our tongue, speaking the appropriate word, not experiencing what Peter did at the Mount of Transfiguration. Right? This foolishness of feeling the need to fill in with talking all the time. Um, and when we speak less, when we control our tongues, then we learn that we can listen better. We can observe more. Those things are sharpened when we talk less. We are able to pay attention. And Carol, what's the greatest failing of humankind? Not paying attention. Not paying attention. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't set this up today. That's another thing I, I say a lot. I believe Scripture says the glory of God is evident in His handiwork if we are just paying attention. But we're not. Any questions about that before we take a break? We don't we don't have a full hour more to deal with when we come back. But, uh, anything? I'll be quiet. You're being yeah. very quiet. I appreciate that. You're making sure you do not speak inappropriate words. The sacrifice of fools. All right, I've got five minutes still. Let's go until five minutes after two o'clock. Uh, I want to get talk about a couple more things, and then I'll, I'll get to the issue. Two people have asked me already today. Well, if you're listening, how do you know it's God's voice? And I want to talk about that. Um, first, good. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Yeah, 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 I'm listening. I won't be quiet. Um, a couple of things. Donald Whitney has another quote. As sleep and rest are needed each day for the body, so silence and solitude are needed each day for the soul. It is the place where we are replenished in our souls, and we need quiet. Um, I'm going to talk about how you find quiet in several different ways in a few minutes. But Jim Elliott, you know Jim Elliott of the, the, who died in an effort to take the gospel to the Alka Indians. Uh, his wife Elizabeth has written a number of books. Uh, Jim Elliott, in his very short life, he was a very young man, wrote some brilliant things. Uh, he is the one who said, it is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Talking about the gospel, which is brilliant. He also said this, Jim Elliott said, I think the devil has made it his business to monopolize on three elements. Noise, hurry, crowds. Satan is quite aware of the power of silence. The devil doesn't want you to find time for silence and solitude to come before the Lord. Because he knows when you do, then he is defeated. That that is the place where God will give you the encouragement and the nurture and the strength and the vision and the hear clear hearing of his voice. The devil doesn't want that. So he has a strong motivation to keep you. In noise and hurry and crowds and talking all the time. So that's why we need to be quiet. A couple more scripture verses here. Uh, Psalm 37 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Still and patient. And I believe, again, stillness, whenever that's referred to in scripture, I believe it combines the idea of being alone and quiet. Because you're not going to be still in the midst of a crowd. Okay? Your spirit isn't going to be still. Zephaniah 1 7, be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Silent before the Lord. And Isaiah 30 15, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength. And the word trust there, I think, is critical. Quietness and trust is your strength. I really do believe that for most of us, the reason we are we are reluctant or even fearful of being quiet and alone is because we don't really trust God. We don't really trust He's there for us, that He will not desert us, that He is always present for us, and that He will look out for us. We don't have to have noise all the time, or people around us all the time, in order to be okay if we really trust in God. Okay? Now, I want to get into the, the issue of the balance between solitude and quiet and Christian fellowship in a minute. 
But let me talk for a second about the issue of God's voice. How do you know if it's God's voice you're hearing? Well, there's several things that you can do to protect yourself. And I say protect yourself because it is possible for the devil to try to, to deceive you. You know, there have been people all the way down through history that have been believing that they did God's will because the devil convinced them that it was God speaking and it wasn't. Let me say several things. First, I believe whenever we enter into a time of prayer, particularly if it is a time of silence and solitude, there is a vulnerability associated with that, a spiritual vulnerability. And I think we should always be prepared to ask God to protect us, to make sure that, that we, we are hearing God, the Holy Spirit, speak to us and not some other voice, not our own appetites, not the devil himself. So ask for God to bless you. Jesus said, you know, ask, knock. You know, you, if you ask, you will receive. If you knock, the door will be open to you. The promise has been made that if we come to the Lord and ask Him, He will respond to us. So claim that promise by asking God to direct you and protect you in that. That's the first thing. And then do ask. One of the things that I have experienced over and over and over again in my own prayer life, often enough that I hate it. <laughs> no. uh, it, it just... It's, it's so obvious to me, and yet, so often, um, well, i give you an example. I will find myself, and I say, Lord, I really need an answer to something. I have a problem with this, and then immediately something will come into my mind. Frequently, it's like, well, why don't you do something about that? Okay. And I have to stop, and I've learned to just stop and say, that's the Lord. He answered that quickly. Immediately something came into my mind as a response to that. And it, it almost always, when I say I hate it, I don't hate it, but it always reminds me of the, of the old Pogo cartoon. And you know, remember Pogo? Mm -hmm. Right, these little critters? In, in Pogo, one of the characters comes up and says, you know, I went to God the other day and I said, with all the suffering and hurt and pain in the world, there's so much grief and anxiety and warfare and everything else, and why don't you do something about it? And then the other character said, and what did God say? God said the same thing to me. <laughs> okay? Often, when I pray, when I ask God in prayer for something, for the answer to something, a prop, if it's a problem, an issue, some need, whatever, usually, I'll hear, immediately almost, something will come into my mind, and usually it has something to do with how to resolve the issue. Well, why don't you go talk to the person that you're having a problem? <laughs> okay. Well, why don't you address that need? No. Um, well, if you think that needs to be said, why don't you say that? Barbara. So how do you differentiate between that and your intellect and intelligence? Well, reason. Because that's what I struggle with. Right. Well, God uses your intellect and your reason and your imagination and your creativity. God uses all those things. God speaks through the imagination. In fact, there's a great line in... St. Joan of the Ark, um, George Bernard Shaw's play about St. Joan. And Joan is describing how she hears God's voice. You know, God speaks to her and tells her what to do. And the inquisitors who are, who are you know, trying her, they say, oh, that's just your imagination. And Joan says, yes, that's how God speaks to me. God made my imagination. He made my intellect. He made my reason. He speaks through those things. Now... How do, you, how do you know? Well, it's, first I think we ask God to direct us and protect us from wrong. And then we have to say, is that consistent with what I know of God? Is it consistent with what Scripture says? Is it consistent with what God has testified to through the church? Be it the creeds or whatever. You know, if God starts telling me that you know, I need to have all blonde people murdered, <laughs> no! That's not God. That's, that's a devil from hell. And that's an obvious one. And sometimes it won't be so obvious. But our next question, if, 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 we, if we hear something that we think might be God speaking, we need, to, we need to then ask the question, okay, is this God? Is this consistent with everything I know of God? Does this sound like Him? Right? Um, people who get messages about, you know, pull the trigger and say God is speaking to them, no. That's not God. And if they, had, if, they were, if they were reasonable and they asked themselves that question, the answer would be no. That's not something God would say to me. But if you have asked God to speak to you and asked for protection from wrong 
thought. If you have asked in faith and you hear an answer, and you ask the question, is this consistent with what I know about God? Does this sound like something God would say to me? And the answer is yes. But I believe that part of our faith in Him, part of our trust in Him, is that He will not allow us to go astray if we have done that, those things. Okay? Because He does not desire, I've said many times, God does not want to trick us or trap us or trip us up. That is not the business He is in. He wants us to know His will for us. And if we have asked, if we've asked for guidance and protection from wrong, if we have honestly sought His will and we feel He's answered and His answer is not inconsistent with anything else we know of Him in His Word or how He has acted or His nature, then I believe we should have faith that that is God speaking to us. Fair? Any questions about that? What about a baby Christian mm -hmm. who really doesn't have anything other than a basic understanding? Right. How do they know? How do they well, this is one of the reasons that, that Christians are not supposed to be in isolation. Okay, We talked about the church on Wednesday in our theology class. And one of the things that we identified is from the very start in the Christian church, from the, from the time of literally Jesus still being here on, the very idea of somebody being a Christian in isolation, that is not as part of the body of Christ, part of the church, uh, would have been inconceivable. I mean, that would have been an oxymoron to them. You can't be a Christian in isolation. If you're part of the body of Christ, you're part of the body of Christ. And so part of the responsibility of the body of Christ is to bring up and to teach and to train and protect those who are new to faith. That's why we have churches. For one reason, and one thing, that's why we do things like the new members class. Even though it's only four hours, we get all the basic doctrines kind of stuff. And if there's somebody who's really beginning to be led in the wrong direction, hopefully we'll begin to see some flags. It's the reason we do Bible studies. It's the reason we do all sorts of things. The reason that we're open to hear and speak to and address. It is true that somebody who is very new to the faith, very young in the faith, may start to get things wrong. It's our job, and not just me as pastor, but all of us who have been in the faith longer, to help them understand more. more in that. So there is some assumption in the things I just said about, you know, uh, seeking God's voice, asking for protection, then asking what we need in faith, listening for His voice, and then if it's consistent with what we know of Him, believing and trusting that God would speak to us and that it is Him. Sometimes I think the problem is that we begin to think God's not really going to talk to me. You know, we lack the faith that God really does want to communicate with us. And that begun, becomes our stumbling block. I believe God wants to speak to us. God wants to, to tell us what He wants. And so we need to be open to that, believe and trust that that's the case. If somebody is young in the faith, we need to be there to help them. Harvey. My story is the young couple in seminary where one morning he went to her and said, God's revealed to me that we're to be married. And she said, well, that's wonderful. And we will be as soon as he tells me. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do your delivery for other people. Right. Absolutely. And I had a friend, uh, Richard Sears, my friend who was an English professor at Berea College, was a Christian. After he got his PhD, he had the president of a small, like really small, Christian college contact him and say, we really don't have any money to pay you, but God has told me you're supposed to come and be on our faculty. And Richard said, well, it's the same thing. As soon as God tells me that, I'll be there. <laughs> and he didn't. Okay? And, uh, and it wasn't. So, yeah, that's true. We, we need to be careful that we're not putting it on somebody else. But we, have, we always, we need to use our good sense. You know, if we, if we hear something that could be God speaking to us, and it's clearly not what God is like, we need to use our good sense. I... Uh, I don't have it on today, I haven't worn it recently, but um, some of you all have Fitbits, right? They're, they're the little uh, pedometers and then that you wear and you go to whatever counts your steps and all that. Well, the, the pedometer, this Fitbit, the new ones, when you, uh, when you first pick it up, when it first detects any motion, it has a little slogan, you can do it or whatever. Well, one morning, I picked the thing up to put it on and it said, burn it. <laughs> expected the next day for it to say, kill them all. <laughs> well, if I get a message like that, that's not God speaking. Okay, somebody programmed that into a Fitbit. So, yeah, we need to use our good sense. God gave us our intelligence, our reason, our imagination. And I love the thing about St. Joan when they said, oh, that's just your imagination, hearing those voices. And Joan says, yes, that's how God speaks to me. It is often. He made us. He can use us as his speaker. Okay. 
Amen. Any questions about that? Does that help, Jerry and yes. Pat? Amen. Amen. Yes, it does. A lot of times I lay down at night to go to sleep, and I think of all these things that we could do at the church activities. Now, is this God talking to me? Uh, it could be. Um, if it is, you're in trouble. Uh, uh, <laughs> is God speaking to you about all the ways the pastor needs to be different than he is? <laughs> okay. uh, I think that God inspires us to vision. I mean, um, did, if we had not, if we had not, and we're not still attempting great things, I believe for the Lord, I don't think we would be where we are as a church. Look on the wall. Okay. <laughs> How many, how many churches with 70 members are dreaming like this? And we are not because we won't want to be great, but because we want God to be seen as great. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I honestly, I stand before the Lord and say, this is not a pride issue for me, and I don't think it is for other people. Um, and yet we want great things for God. Well, if we don't let Him inspire us to great things, then we're not going to achieve great things. But we don't, want to, we don't break anybody on the rack in order to get there. That's one of the signs. If we were doing that, that's one of the signs that there's something wrong with either either the goal or how we're doing it. Okay. All right. I want to talk now for a few minutes about the balance between solitude and silence and Christian fellowship. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about practicing silence and solitude, how we actually do it, and give you some hopefully guidelines that you can begin to practice these things in a in a reasonable and practical way. <coughs> The first thing that I would mention is, uh, let me give you one quote, and then I want to give a couple of other things. Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, the greatest American-born theologian ever. Okay? This is not Jonathan Edwards, who's a recent politician. Uh, and so many people, if you know Jonathan Edwards, when I was in high school, in our, in our book as a sample of Puritan writing, they had Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is a famous sermon he did. And some people think that that Jonathan Edwards was just this hellfire, brimstone, everybody's going to hell kind of preacher. Not at all. He was the most reasonable and well thought and, and articulate, probably, well, I believe, theologian ever to come out of America. Bar none. He wrote this, A true Christian doubtless delights in religious fellowship and Christian conversation. We all enjoy that. And finds much to affect his heart in it. But he also delights at times, that is a true Christian, also delights at times to retire from all mankind, to converse with God in solitude. And this also has peculiar advantages. Peculiar in this, in this case means particular advantages. This also has peculiar advantages for fixing his heart and engaging his affections. True religion disposes persons to be, to be much alone in solitary places, for holy meditation and prayer, to delight in retirement, and secret converse with God. What he's saying here is, we all enjoy fellowship, we all enjoy banter as Christians, and you know, the, the interaction that we have before church and everything else. That's wonderful, and that's of God. But a true, a mature Christian faith also seeks time of, as he says, retiring from mankind, of solitude, of silence. In fact, the testimony down through the last 2,000 years of the church is that when we seek out silence and solitude, we end up finding a more meaningful relationship with other believers. Our periodic practice of silence and solitude actually gives us the ability to have more fulfilling relationships in Christian community. The fruit of solitude and silence includes having increased sensitivity and compassion for other people. It becomes a kind of freedom. By being quiet and alone sometimes, we have greater freedom to be with other people. I'll give you a couple more quotes. Thomas Merton said, It is in deep solitude that I find the gentleness with which I can truly love my brothers. The more solitary I am, the more affection I have for them. Solitude and silence teach me to love my brothers for what they are, not for what they say. And again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you all know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, martyr in the Second World War, <coughs> who wrote some wonderful books. The Cost of Discipleship, Life Together is one about Christian community where he deals with the disciplines. In fact, in Life Together, he has a chapter called uh, Life Together, and then the next chapter is called Life Apart. 
You know, so he deals with community and solitude. He says, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Each by itself has profound pitfalls and perils. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings. And one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. A mature Christian life has a balance <coughs> of solitude and silence and fellowship and conversation. In fact, silence and solitude are the complementary disciplines to fellowship, which is a discipline of the faith as well. Appropriate, fulfilling, gratifying Christian fellowship. God, is, God calls us into community. I said earlier that throughout the history of the church, the idea of being a solitary Christian with very few exceptions, like the Stylites, you know, the guys who sat on top of poles for years at a time. The idea of being a solitary Christian apart from the community of the church would be an oxymoron. It's, it's, it's an absurdity. There's no sense to that. We are part of a community as we are part of the body of Christ, as we are saved. Okay? Without silence and solitude, we are shallow. Without fellowship, we are stagnant. We need both. We need a balance. But because one of them is naturally, at least when you start, is naturally more fun than the other, we tend to want to go toward the fellowship all the time and not the silence and solitude. We need both to be mature. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, I want to spend a few minutes now and give you several points as to how to do this. How do you actually experience and practice silence and solitude in a practical way? The first thing, and a lot of this material, by the way, is in the two, is in your books. If you have the two books, when you read this section, then you'll come across a lot of what I'm saying today. Um, the first thing I think, and that we need to recognize, is that we can look for and reclaim moments of silence throughout our day. Pat, you mentioned you lie in bed at night, you have all these, you know, these thoughts of things. Well, when you first lie down, or when you first wake up, there are times of quiet. Do we claim those as moments of silence? To particularly like in the morning when you first wake up, you present yourself to the Lord, you ask for his guidance, you say, Lord, what would you have me know today? What would you have me experience? What would you want me to hear of you today? That's a wonderful moment of silence and solitude. And I should have mentioned earlier when I was talking about um, hearing God's voice in silence, I once taught a a, I was in a, attending an Episcopal church in Pasadena, right next door to the seminary I went to. And there was a group of people there, and the, there were several people in this. It was a study we were doing of Jürgen Moltmann's book, Experiences of God, which is a really good book. That's Moltmann, not Boltmann. Boltmann, not so good. Moltmann, good. Uh, so, Jürgen Moltmann. And we're studying this book, and we were meeting in the tea house in the back garden of a house in San Marino, California. If you know any of that area, San Marino is like... Not pretty. Well, when people are too rich for Beverly Hills, they move to San Marino. Okay? Um, and so, the tea house in the back garden in San Marino. And the couple that were, we were meeting there, because the wife wanted us to meet there, the husband started out the first night, everybody's introducing themselves, by saying, I don't know God, I don't need to know God, I don't care about God, all the ones for him to leave me alone. That was our first night. Okay. Well, in the course of this class, I had this miraculous experience that throughout the week as I would prepare for this class, I would think of something or come across some, some quote or some whatever, C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chester or something, and I'd say, oh, well, I'll take that along, it might be used for that. And invariably, this happened to me over and over for the time we were in this class, somebody would say something, likely cynical, because we had several cynics in this group. I don't know why they came. Uh, this one guy was there because his wife insisted on doing it. Um, but, and I would go, well, I, I have a quote from C.S. Lewis. Let me pull this out from under my chair. Okay, and it would just be right there. Well, at the very end of this class, it, something that I've used, I've said since then, but the Lord inspired it in me at that time. I, I said to these folks, sometime when you're in your bed at night and your spouse is asleep, there's nobody there to impress. 
It doesn't matter in that moment whether you were very successful in multiple businesses and had big cars and big houses. There's nobody there who cares at that moment. And you lie there and you look up and you say, something is still missing. Again, these are all very wealthy people. I said, when you say in that quiet moment, something is missing, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. That is the God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. Now, I, I thought about this earlier while I was teaching and I didn't mention it. When we talk about hearing God's voice, the times we hear God's voice are times like that, when there's nobody there to impress. Even our spouse is asleep. And yet we're awake, and we're <coughs> present. That is a moment of silence where we can stand before the Lord, or lie before the Lord, and say, what do you have for me? And for people, I said that that's a time to, to seek salvation. And those moments of silence, when nothing about you is particularly impressive, there's nobody there to impress, that's when I believe we can experience in that silence and in that solitude, God's presence. Okay. So look for those moments in your life. It could be when you're sitting in traffic or you're standing in line at Santander Bank or whatever it is. doesn't mean there has to be nobody around you, but you can have a moment of quiet. Right? And I think that those little solitudes, I think it's Whitney that calls them the little solitudes, that you can find throughout your day, start trying to claim those. And when you have those moments, take them as opportunities to present yourself to the Lord. And then identify other times. I've mentioned again before, um, a friend of mine who, was sec who became secretary to one of the pastors at University Presbyterian Church many years ago, um, a great guy who was the pastor. This was a woman who was my friend. who She and I were sem in seminary together. Um, she, when she first started, she was looking at his calendar book, and like two or three or four times during the day, he would have periods, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes set aside, and it just said SBL. Well, she, he was very, you know, a great guy, prominent, great teacher, PhD, he, people were much in, in demanding his time, and so he'd have people calling, and she was trying to schedule things, and so she went to him and said, Okay, in order to be able to work your schedule, you've got these things in your schedule all through the week that say just, you know, uh, SBL. Can I move those? Are those, you know, what, what is that? <clears throat> and he very quietly said, SBL means stand before the Lord. And no, those can't be moved. He put it in his calendar several times during the day. He would have moments of silence and solitude. Nobody in his office, the door closed, where he would stand before the Lord. What wisdom. Find those little moments of, it doesn't have to be a week-long retreat. Find those little solitudes, either in the events of the day or put them in your calendar, where you stand before the Lord and quiet and listen for His voice. Right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be something, you know, so mundane. Susanna Wesley, <coughs> this is mentioned in one, one of the two books, <coughs> was the mother of Charles Wesley and John Wesley. John Wesley, who started, you know, Methodism, the Methodism movement, and Charles Wesley who wrote so many of the hymns. Charles always said, John, you can ordain as many bishops as you want as long as I get to write the music. Um, well, their mother, Susanna, there was a large family. They didn't have a large house. There was not much place for her to go, and so she had, as a habit, when she needed some quiet and solitude to read God's Word or to listen to God, she would sit at the kitchen table and pull her apron over her head. And the kids all knew that when Mama sat at the kitchen table with her apron over her head, she needs to be left alone. <laughs> Those were her moments of solitude. It can be something as mundane as that. Okay. To find those little solitudes throughout the day. That's a start. Right? A second, and they sort of progress. Second is to develop your daily time of being alone with God, especially as part of your Bible study and prayer. Find that time, and again, you guys have been in the class for the Bible study and the prayer times. You cannot have an effective Bible study and prayer if the TV's on or the radio's going or there's a bunch of people around you talking. Now, it's possible to go to a coffee shop or something and sort of isolate yourself. I used to love to mow the lawn. <coughs> when I mowed the lawn, it was the lawnmower as just sort of this droning sound. It's like those, that was a meditation time for me. <laughs> Can't do it anymore because we have a garden now. But uh, but it, well, you know it's possible to do it, but, but in a noisy environment. But only if you can cut all that out. 
The point is, set a time daily to be alone with God, especially as part of your Bible study and prayer. And that's, that's a, a huge priority. The third thing is, then, to find a quiet place where you can be alone and quiet. That's a quiet place where you can be quiet. At home, <laughs> at church, or elsewhere. And by the way, Rich, one of the changes we're going to make to our plans is we're going to have a prayer chapel. Oh, yes. We're going to have some place in this building, when we get a building, <laughs> that is going to be a chapel, someplace comfortable, and the, the rules are going to be simple. Anybody can go in there anytime they want and sit Sorry. and meet and pray. The only thing they can do is talk or make other noise. All right? So that there will always be a place that you know you can come to Lakeside Presbyterian Church and have a place for quiet. Yeah, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to find a place. It may be in the corner at LCS. It may be in a corner in your house. Some places, I've read this before, and Foster mentions it, some places, some families who don't have a lot of extra room, they'll have a quiet chair. And the whole family knows that whoever, if somebody sits in that chair, it's because they need time for quiet. Don't bother them. Don't speak to them. Leave them alone. Find a quiet place where you can plan to have regular times of silence or solitude. And, you know, if you're in a town in the north, I'd say, a public library. Well, we don't actually have a public library. But some place that you can go to be quiet and alone. We have a church library. We have a church library. You can go back there. Okay? And you guys will stop me if you have any questions or comments, right? Uh, four, ask God to give you peace about being able to talk less and to talk only when it's appropriate. Remember, some people, we tend to talk so much because we're uncomfortable not talking or uncomfortable with silences. We have to have control. We have to, there's a self-justification. We don't trust God to be in charge. Ask God to give you the grace to be able to talk less often and to talk when it's appropriate, not when it isn't appropriate, the sacrifice of fools. Perhaps try to live for an entire day without talking. It would be hard for me. <laughs> but, you know, or, or just periods of time. And, and then try to let, you know, when you do speak, try to let the words that you use be few and full. Few words, more meaning. And the fifth thing is consider then, once you practice some of these other, the, the little solitudes, the regular time of prayer and Bible study, Perhaps a quiet place where you can go, again, for prayer, for solitude, some place that you do several times a week, ideally. Consider a longer retreat of silence and solitude. A, a day, a weekend, or even a week or longer. Particularly if you're coming to a huge decision in your life, or there's something you really need to deal with, get away. Go to the coast, some place that you can, you know, you don't have to... <laughs> North Coast. <laughs> Sierra. Is there like a monastery near here? <laughs> There is a retreat center. Uh, who was telling me about that? It's um, between here and the coast. We talked about <coughs> mentioned it to me as a possibility for a church retreat. We talked about Tapalpa. We talked about. I think Tapalpa is the one I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah Tapalpa. Uh, it's a town. It's that a there's a retreat center. A small uh, Anna Rosa. She left. There's a small hotel that has five or six rooms. Yeah, the whole hotel. And, and we, we want to talk about having a retreat for the church at some point. Now, part of that would be you know, for teaching and prayer and direction for the church. Part of it would be time for quiet as well. <clears throat> and I can remember early on in my Christian walk that you know, they'd have retreats and they'd say, okay, you know, the next two hours will be quiet time. Take your Bible, find someplace quiet. And I'm going, shouldn't we be doing something productive? <laughs> that is productive. That's about as productive as you get. Okay. But... Uh, a retreat center, some other place you can be alone and quiet. It'd be good for us to try to find exactly where that might be. Uh, you, some of you all, church leaders, help me with that. We'll, let's see if we can find some place that could be a retreat center, someplace accessible, not too far away. Okay? Maybe we'll all go out to La Ola. Uh, <laughs> for <quite a> time. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Questions about any of that? And it sort of start, we start out with the, the little solitudes, the, the reclaiming moments, and work our way up to longer kinds of things. In the similar way, any, any of these spiritual disciplines, um, 
fasting, prayer, Bible study, silence and solitude. Don't try to jump in the deep end until you're sure you can swim in it. Okay? Start out small. Start out slow. God will honor that. He will respect that. You do not have to be Mother Teresa by this time next week. Okay? Um, God will honor your efforts and He will let you grow in it. But start slow. Do what you can and then grow into it. Questions or comments? Rich. You know, talking about so silence and solitude, uh, in those times we're trying to listen to what God has to say to us. And I think of Angie a lot because she's always hearing from God. And, uh, you know, she'll say, oh, I just thought about somebody. And then about 10 minutes later, she'll say, I thought about that same person again. So what she does, she goes straight to the telephone and calls yeah. her. Because that's, you know, and then there's a contact, uh, uh, a communication going that uh, was needed. Yeah, to be responsive to what God is, you know, the and, and the other thing that I think, when I had an extra car we had to sell, and it was I was fixing it up and I, and I wasn't selling it. And she says, we've got to get this car sold. She says, I'm going to take it out right now. So she jumped in the car and started driving along the street, and she says, God, where do you want me to, what do you want me to do? And so suddenly she said, uh, oh, I think I'm supposed to park the car over here in front of this house, and it was about five blocks from our house. She got home, the telephone called, and she says, a car just parked, the people on the phone, a car just parked in front of our house uh, for sale. Uh, we're interested in buying it. <laughs> and they bought it. Good. <laughs> you can't steer a parked car. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't steer a parked car, that's what they say. So, sometimes you got to get in and drive it somewhere. Right? That was Henrietta Beers when she was talking about following God's guide on things, guide something. She said sometimes you you know you pray to God, you ask for direction, and you have to get in and start moving. You know, you can't steer yeah. a parked car. If God God maybe will steer you where to go, but you have to start moving. Okay. So yeah, that's good. That's all I have for today. Um, it's been a tough week here in Lake Wobegon. So um, appreciate it everyone.